Thanks so much for having me, Lenka, and hello to everybody who has tuned in for today's live stream all about repurposing and distribution. I'm really excited to share with you, um, you know, some secrets and secrets is probably a big word, but, you know, tips that I've come to rely on over the years because I do have a social media agency um, and we, you know, 95% of what we do for our clients is content creation. And within that, we do a lot of repurposing because from a business standpoint, we can't be creating content brand new every single day, all of the time, because one, we're not the industry expert. We become micro experts in things um, <laughs> because we have to. But ultimately, I can never have the knowledge bank in the industry that my client has. Um, and for you here today, you're in the same position where um, you have the knowledge, yes, but you can't be creating brand new content every single day um, because it's taxing, it takes a lot of time, depending on the format in which you create really depends on the time investment as well. And some of us are fast at, you know, we might like blogging. Some of us are fast at writing. Some of us are slow. Some of us are good on camera. Some of us don't feel confident on camera. There's so many different factors that contribute to content creation. And so today I want to run you through basically our process of how we go about creating content with our clients because I think that this is the most efficient way. I know a lot of you here want speed. You want to um, make content creation faster and more efficient. And so I've got some tools to share with you today as well. Um, but really I want to take you through our process because if you get the process right from the beginning, the rest of it uh, becomes faster. So the time investment should be upfront. And again, that's going to be different for everybody. Um, but then after that, the repurposing becomes easier, becomes faster. So let me share my slides with you. Just bear with me for one second. Awesome. I will just give a huge shout out to everyone who's joining us tonight. We have a good handful of people watching live. Hello. Good to have you here. Good to have your first time joining and hello everyone who's joining. So hopefully, you know, you'll get a good value from this. Keep watching, keep your questions coming and we'll collect them and we'll get to all of your questions at the end of the session. But without any hassle, here's it, your slide, Sarah. Amazing. So um, Lenka, you can see my slides now on the screen. Yeah, all good. Okay, awesome. All right, so let's go through this. Before before I even start, I will just say this. You know, a lot of social media experts will tell you to choose one channel and as in one platform. So whether that's Facebook or LinkedIn or YouTube. And, you know, I, for a long time, I preached the same message and I really believed in it. But I think where, as we shift further and further into a content and a knowledge age, we need to look at how we can be across more than one platform. And I do believe that two is better than one. If you can do more, so so be it. I don't want to overwhelm anyone, but I think that we all need to be on two platforms because essentially there is, you know, without going into it too heavily, there's platforms that are SEO driven, which means hashtags and, um, and Google drives them. And so we're, we're thinking here, Pinterest, YouTube, Twitter, um, even banks tweets in Google. Um, no, that's off the top of my head. And then we have other platforms like uh, that are more social driven and, and content driven in a completely different ways. So we've got Facebook, Instagram, LinkedIn. And I know those places use hashtags and things like that as well, but they're not um, SEO driven, so to speak. So I think Ultimately, that should be a question that you ask yourself over time. Am I on both a social platform and an SEO driven platform? Because that is going to give you maximum opportunity to be found basically on the internet. So think about that as we go into this, because one of the main reasons that you want to repurpose is so that you can be in more places 
than one at any given time. And, and part of that as well is to not be, you know, not have your LinkedIn, uh, sorry, not your LinkedIn, your Instagram and your Facebook linked up so that you're posting to one, it's automatically posting to the other. What we want to do is have slightly different content so that it makes sense for that person to follow us on both Facebook and Instagram. Um, and then that allows for your touch points with them to increase, which basically means that the path to purchase with you becomes shorter for them, right? Because you're interacting with them more across different places. So that's just a social media crash course. <laughs> um, but let's dive into the actual repurposing. So essentially this here is my model. What we do is we start with what I like to call pillar content. And I've made them circles to remind you that they're pillars. So we, we, we have three things to choose from here, really. We've got video, we've got audio, and we've got written. And within this, you can see here under video, I've just written what I believe pillar content is. So that can be a YouTube video. Um, that can be a live stream that you do. So for Lenka, this would actually be a pillar piece of content for her. Even though I'm the one speaking today, she now has the ability to work with this piece of content and repurpose it in different ways. And we'll talk about that as we go. Um, and with live video, the beauty is, you know, if you're, audience uh, is on Facebook or you've been nurturing an audience there, maybe it's in a Facebook group as well as your Facebook page, um, on Instagram and YouTube, you can all, you can live stream on all of those platforms. You can also live stream on Twitter, but I didn't really include it because for a lot of people, it's not their main social media platform, but just know that you can. Um, the other ways to have pillar content with video is, you know, if you have a speaking engagement and it's filmed, that then becomes a pillar piece of content for you because typically most people at least speak for 30 minutes, you know, 15 minutes at a pinch, like for a little mini workshop or something like that. But most people are speaking between 30 and 60 minutes and um, and that usually comprises a QA and a at the end as well. So there's actually a lot to work with if you are a speaker or do any speaking engagements. And then further to that, or in addition to that, I should say I've included there a webinar or training. So for example, if at the end of this training, Lenka says to me, hey, do you want a copy of this? I could then turn that into other content. So with audio, there's not a lot of options. Um, you've basically, if you're creating a podcast, then that's your pillar content, right? Um, and the other way to go about it is, you know, simply if you make an audio training, so an audio file, a voice memo, um, I know a few people who do that and and do it very well. But for the most part, if audio is your pillar piece of content, it's it's typically through a podcast. And then with written, the obvious, you know, blog post. Um, I know people who don't necessarily blog first and foremost, but they write LinkedIn articles. And I've also included their long form Facebook posts um, because I have clients who that's they don't blog but they'll write a long form Facebook post or I'll write the long form Facebook post for them. So um, there's definitely different, different ways to approach this. And I will say, look, this isn't an exhaustive list of pillar content either. Um, there's probably other things that you've got going on in your mind. You know, some of you might be thinking, oh, okay, with audio, well, you could also take the, the audio from a video and that could be a pillar piece of content. Absolutely correct. I just didn't add it because I would say that the video is the pillar piece of content and then the audio is the repurposed moment, right? So it doesn't really matter how you approach it and how you think about it. I'm just giving you the basic framework and the basic understanding of what we're trying to work with. And I show you this because if you can get this part right, if you can make a pillar piece of content consistently, so for myself, for Eleven Lights Media, which is my company, I create a YouTube video weekly, or at least I try. <laughs> so for most weeks, I'm putting out a, you know, 15 minute roughly video on YouTube, and that's my pillar piece of content. Um, other, others of you might have a podcast. Um, and again, others of you might be blogging. So I know even before I was really consistent with video, and even when 
I wasn't able to be consistent with video. I would sit down and I, I would write blog posts um, and I would repurpose them on Medium. Um, some of you might know that website, but basically it's a it's a blogging platform. So if you can do this once a week, once a fortnight, once a month and, and put out a pillar piece of content, then you've got something to work with. What I will say to this point as well, particularly if you're doing video, really if you're doing any of it, but particularly video because it is such an exhausting <laughs> way to create content because if you've essentially got to research, you've got to write it out, then you've got to, got to film it, speak to the camera, it needs to be edited um, and then it needs to be posted and distributed. You might want to batch that content, create four videos at once, create eight videos at once. I've just come off the back of yesterday. I finished my fifth video. Um, this is the first time I've actually ever been that far ahead. I've had my agency for five years. It's the first time I've ever had five videos ready to go. Um, and that's now because I have a videographer and we're able to schedule that time in. But honestly, for the most part, for the last however many years, I've just been doing it as a weekly video. And even then, it's when I have time. So I highly suggest to you to be organized, to make the process faster, to batch this type of content. And also you can do that with podcasts. Um, written might be a little bit easier for some of you um, to do weekly, but I definitely suggest the other two because it's an energy exchange um, to, to batch that. Okay, so let's move on to how we can begin to repurpose. So here you can see that with the with the video, once you've got it created, what we do for our clients is we obviously create the entire video, we edit it up, but I always give my clients a teaser video. Sometimes that's just the first 50 seconds of the video. I always try and think in, in um, the different platforms. So I know that I can't have anything more than 59 seconds on an Instagram feed, otherwise it turns into an Instagram TV. And we don't want that because you get more eyeballs on the sub 60 video. So where we, we always create a, a snippet that can go on Instagram. And again, because it's a snippet, um, if my client doesn't use Instagram, they can put that snippet on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. Um, when we do my videos as well, we do the same thing and I put them everywhere. A lot of my clients are very platform specific and because they have, uh, particularly, particularly with my YouTube clients, um, I'm not doing their social media for them. So they typically have someone doing it for them. Um, and they're not as obsessed with content as me, so they're not putting it in as many places. But the, the beauty of having it done well um, from the beginning is that that opportunity is there. And I do that because then what happens is not only do we now have a video, a full-length video, we then have a thumbnail that goes with that. So I can share that thumbnail everywhere, and that in and of itself becomes a piece of content. Then I also have a snippet or a teaser. That becomes another piece of content that I can share across my platforms. And then, um, you know, for us here at 11 Lights Media, um, my videographer always creates another snippet out of the actual content itself where it showcases like a key tip from the video. And because my videos are 15 minutes long, it's not a big deal. I'm not giving away this any surprises I'm really just showcasing a snippet on its own and if you're going down this route of video you may as well build that into your process whether you get someone to do this and edit it up from Fiverr or Upwork or something like that or you have someone in-house or you get someone third party like an agency like us you if you build that in, then you know that you have content for days and you can continue to repurpose that. You don't obviously have to share all of this in the first week, right? You have snippets that you can feed into your content calendar to be able to point people back to that major piece of content. I don't want my videos on YouTube, YouTube to be one hit wonders. I want to be able to remind people, hey, I've got this tutorial over there. You can go and watch that. 
So maybe I reshare a thumbnail. Maybe I have different versions of a thumbnail. So remember that all these things are possible. It doesn't have to just be one answer, right? We don't just need one thumbnail. We can have three different versions. And on that, I actually just hired a new co content creator within the business. And I just, I said to her, this is the video coming out this week. I'd love to see what you can create. And so now I actually have three different thumbnails for this week's video because my videographer created the first one and I got her to create two more. Um, well, I didn't ask her to create two more. She just created two and she said, which one do you like? And I liked them both. So now I can, you know, in a week, in two weeks, in a month, I can feed these into my content calendar and remind my audience that that video is over there and you can do the same, right? So that's what this first one here is, snippets. Um, and I know I just spent a lot of time on that, but I, I spent time on it because if you're going to go down the route of video, you really want to maximize what you get out of it. Um, and there is so much I haven't put on this slide, by the way, and I'm going to try and dive into it as quickly as I can because content is such a big topic and I don't want to go over time, but at the same time, I want to make sure that you walk away feeling like, there are so many things I can do, my mind is blown. So the other obvious thing that we can do is turn this into a blog post. Now, um, you might hear people talk about getting the the video transcribed and then just putting that under the, um, the video that's embedded on your website, right? You can do that. I'm not a huge fan of that because it doesn't sound natural. When we speak to a camera, it's very different to a written piece. So sure, use it as your template, as your base. But what I like to do is essentially go through, write the heading, write the subheadings, and then fill it out. Now, I do like writing. So my word is not law on any of this. Do what be best suits you. If transcribing it and putting that together is what best suits you, then then do it. What, what I would encourage you to do though is tighten up the language because when we speak to a video, unless we're using a teleprompter, we get a little bit casual. Um, maybe we don't articulate the way, uh, the things the way that they should be articulated. And when we write a blog post, we wanna just make sure that we're being succinct and getting to the point and not waffling. Uh, which is what can happen <laughs> when we're on camera. So um, putting it as a blog post on your website and embedding the video is a really, really great idea. And again, it's got that SEO piece attached to it. And if you're putting something on YouTube, that also has the SEO piece attached to it. Um, I've got email here as well, because what we can do is we can always take the title of our video, we can take the meat of our video and turn that into a written piece of content, essentially. I mean, sure, you can email part of the blog post and say, click here to read more and send people through to that. But you can also flesh it out in a brand new way, take the title and approach it differently, maybe simply deep dive into one of the tips that you give or one section of the video. And, um, you know, as an example of that, this week's video that I just released on YouTube is all about how to, uh, it's a, it's a step-by-step -step tutorial for Instagram reels. So showing people how to use that new functionality. Now as an email, of course, I'm going to email my list and tell them, Hey, this video is up. So I really want them to go there and click through, but to give you an example of what I'm talking about, how you might approach it differently. And maybe I could send this email in a week or two weeks. I don't have to send it um, at the exact same time, right? I can send an email and I can talk about why people need to be using Instagram Reels right now. That can be an email in and of itself. So you can see how immediately we have taken the topic of what we talked about here, which is Instagram Reels, and we've deep dived and and um, in within an email to sell the concept to the customer, the client, the person on the, the email list, right? So that's how you can essentially repurpose a video in that regard. Uh, still shots. So I love this one. Um, but you can go through your videos. If you're, you know, you're doing a video, go through and typically in editing software, there's a still shot 
button. And if you just like, a, you know, if you smile at the camera, if you create a funny pose, if you just do something that is Instagram worthy or, you know, social media worthy, take that still shot and use it. It's a really great way of having content for places like Instagram um, and really uh, Facebook itself as well. People love candid shots of you <laughs> doing something. They're not always in love with the super polished stuff. Um, case in point, I had a client this week who I do, you know, we're creating content for her every single day. Um, we get a certain amount of likes and comments on Instagram and she just posted a photo of herself out and about in the city. She went on a little staycation uh, with her partner and posted it on the weekend and we and we don't post for her on the weekend and she got i would say she got five times the engagement we normally get five times the amount of likes five times the amount of comments and it's just because it was that candid moment and people really do pick up on the energy of that so i encourage you to take still shots um, i've got quotes here obviously if you say something profound you give a really good tip um, you know, oftentimes when we're speaking to the camera, something just rolls off the tongue and it never would have done the same way had we written it. So pull that quote and turn it into an image in Canva or something like that, or even just use the quote as text itself as a caption over on uh, Twitter or something like that. And if you say something extra, especially profound, save it in an Excel document and create content out of that quote later on. Because sometimes we feel like, oh, I've done all the work in this video. But what we've really done throughout that video is create micro moments for brand new pieces of content. And that's the really exciting part of creating pillar content. It's not, it's not a stagnant thing. It's a living, breathing piece of work that now we have the opportunity to create new thoughts from because maybe we want to deep dive on something. Like I said, maybe we say something super profound that has more depth and more opportunity for us to, to dive into. And uh, the other way that I've got here is to embed this into LinkedIn. So similar to your blog post, embedding the video into um uh, your website you can embed video into linkedin articles and also again write the the blog post part under it so i highly recommend that to maximize your videos again this is not exhaustive <laughs> we don't have time to be exhaustive um but i just want to get you thinking a little bit differently about how to approach um so our next one is audio and you'll see a few of these have been um, brought over from the video section. So obviously quotes, I've explained to you how we can um, use the prompting of the pillar content to do a new type of email. So the email can be as simple, as simple as sending them to the audio, to the podcast. Um, but again, you can dive deeper with a thought and create an email from that. Um, I've got here audio videos and I'll share an app with you later on that does that well. So essentially what you're doing is grabbing a piece of the audio from the podcast and then turning that into something that is moving. So a video and then you're able to post that on Instagram, Facebook, all the places. Um, so again, I'll share the app with you later on. It's free. Um, you can do five a month before you have to pay. So for most of us, um, you know, if you're doing one brand new piece of content a week, or maybe even if you're doing one podcast a month, you could create five different audio videos out of it and share it throughout that month, right? Um, or you can just do a brand new one each week for your, for the new podcast coming out. Again, I highly recommend you turning any podcast into a blog post or LinkedIn article. Uh, a long form blog. I actually meant to write long form Facebook post. Um, that's tired Sarah writing that there. <laughs> um, so again, long form Facebook post. I love long form on Facebook. If you've not tried it, it's basically the idea is just to write a blog but put it on Facebook because you have almost unlimited characters on there. Um, it, it does limit itself at some point. I just can't remember the cutoff, but it's like you would have to write a book for it to cut you off. 
Um, but the reason I love it is because it works really well on Facebook. Um, and I know that for a fact because last year I went through a phase where I was doing one every single day. And it's the most engaged my Facebook uh, page has ever been. And I simply don't do it now because um, at the time that I was doing it, I wasn't doubling down on video. Um, whereas like now I'm, I'm a lot more consistent with my video output um, and I'm a lot busier too. So I do encourage you to try it if you haven't because you may be surprised at the results. And what you have to remember with um, social media in general is that you're always working with an algorithm. So while you've got a lot of people who might be on your email list or might listen to your podcast, you're going to have a portion who don't, who only follow you on Facebook or Instagram or LinkedIn. So you're wanting to create more visibility um, and therefore create more opportunity for people to connect with you where they may never have connected with you before. Um, Again, with audio as well, if you're doing a podcast, I haven't written it here, but um, you have the ability to essentially create thumbnails around that too, and I would highly recommend doing that. Um, and then I've written Instagram micro content here. Now, micro content is a whole other training, um, and we are at 5.27 a.m. in the morning for me, which means we're nearly out of time, which is good because we are getting to the end. Um but Instagram micro content, let me give you a crash course in that. Going to, when you go to Instagram, go to hashtags that make sense for your industry or go to your explore page and look at the things that are appearing and look at what captures your attention um, and think about how you can represent your pillar piece of content in a visual format. So maybe it's a pie chart, maybe it's a bar graph, maybe it is a um, carousel post, which is just multiple Instagram images, um, and you're putting a new thought on each one. It's just about turning this piece of content into something visual, because we're on a visual platform, and no, it doesn't always have to be a photo of you or a photo of your business. It can be things that you have created in Canva. Um, and, you know, we don't, I don't really have time to, to deep dive, but you're more than welcome to come and have a look at my uh, Instagram at any given time and see what I'm doing there and take the ideas. I don't really care. I'm not precious about it. At the end of the day, it's the, it's the content within the idea that matters. So, um, in terms of format, in terms of the visual aspect of it, take what you need and run with it, my friend. <laughs> okay, and let's just go to written. So we've covered a lot of this here. Um, quotes we've covered, email we've covered, LinkedIn articles we've uh, covered, infographics I basically just talked about there, taking the concept, you know, if I've got a blog post that says three ways to grow on social media, how do I turn that into something visual? I mean, look at this slide that I've created for you today. It's a visual representation of this very section of my talk that I want to talk about. This is essentially an infographic to an extent. And the beautiful thing about Instagram or really any platform is that you have the room to caption things and write good copy around it to give this context. I could share this on LinkedIn and then write a post around it or a LinkedIn article to give this very slide context, right? I could create uh, an article about how to repurpose a written blog post or article of some description into more content. And I could use this as my image. Um, so there's another idea. If you're doing speaking engagements and you've got slides, repurpose those slides. Um, Q and A. So I'm actually going to talk about this a little bit more in the next slide, but essentially it's the idea of taking the subheadings of your blog post and turning it into a question answer where applicable. Um, so if I'm talking about three ways to grow your social media, I can turn that into a Q and A type of post where 
I talk about what is the top way to grow your social media? What, um, what are the top three ways to grow your social media? Um, which, uh, which way is the quickest to repurpose social media, right? So we can, we can turn it into a Q and A and then we can go and share that on Quora or, um, you know, put it simply as a Q&A text post on Facebook or LinkedIn or turn that into something visual. But you can see how we're starting to just think a little bit differently about the pillar content that we've written. And again, I've got Instagram micro content here uh, and we've covered all of this. Okay, this is my favorite slide. Practice makes progress. I cannot stress enough that simply in the doing, simply in the process of exercising this muscle and, and creating new pieces of content and thinking in a new way, you're going to start to see the opportunity within the content. I've been doing this so long now that when I listen to a client's video, when I listen, when I read a blog post, I immediately, my brain automatically goes, that's a quote, I can turn that into a visual graphic, uh, I need to turn that into a QA. and a Like, it's just the way I think. And I'm no different to you. I just do this a lot. And so my brain thinks that way. And there's no reason why you can't get to that place. So that's why I put this slide in. And I just want to run through some concepts with you. So any idea, and you can interchange the word idea with title, any subheading, um, any question, any thought <laughs> can be multiplied, it can be fleshed out, and it can be delved deeper into. So if you're writing a pillar piece of content, you can extract something out of it and turn it into something new. We've kind of talked to, about that um, a little bit today. You can use questions, comments, and feedback as new content ideas. So for me, sometimes when I put out content, particularly on Instagram, people ask questions. So um, that Instagram Reels tutorial I put out today, I've had a couple of people now, both on um, in my Facebook group, Instagram, and actually also on the YouTube video itself say, hey, I don't have the music feature. So now I'm starting to think, hang on, maybe I need to write some follow-up content about how to get the music feature if you don't have it because you have a business account. So I'm going to do that simply because people have said, this is all well and good, but now I have a question. Now I have a comment. Now I have feedback. And that's an opportunity for you to create content. And yes, in, in a sense, you're creating new content, but because the stimulus is there, it makes it so much easier to go about creating it right. We're not, we aren't entirely reinventing the wheel. We're, we're almost just adding to it a little bit. Um, we talked about this before. So this was the Q&A idea. Take your subheadings and make them their own individual micro content posts. If I'm writing three ways to grow on social media, I can then turn that into, you know, a three-part series on Instagram on how to grow social media. And then I just share a new tip each day, right? I share the first <laughs> tip, the second one, and then the third. And there's three pieces of content done for the week. Um, to make content relatable. So we I talked about this as, a, as a, a takeaway for you. To make content relatable, think of it as a tweet. Think of it as something that you would say to somebody who, like a friend who walked around to your house and you had a conversation with and didn't know, didn't really understand what your business was or is, and you had to make it, you had to put it in layman's term, terms and make it um, understandable for them. That's how I like to think of um, relatable content. The other way to make content relatable is through the visual element. So on Instagram right now, you'll see a lot of things have gained popularity. So the reminder, there's a, um, I should have shown these for you on the slides, but I didn't think that far in advance. <laughs> um, the reminder notification is a really popular 
um, piece of micro content right now over on Instagram. And it's because a lot of people have iPhones and they get the reminder notification on their phone. Um, creating something to make it look like a text message, again, is relatable because everybody knows what it looks like on their phone to get a text message. Creating something as a tweet, again, is relatable because a lot of people know what a tweet looks like, even if they don't use Twitter themselves. So it's about making, taking the context from somewhere else and turning it into a relatable moment it's a little bit more complex doing it visually, um, you know, if you're not doing it day in, day out like I am. But again, that's why we use things like Instagram to just research and see what's popping up, see what people are using. Because then when you think, how are they making that relatable? You know, a lot of people are, are using iPads these days to write um, their quotes. So it looks like handwriting and there's a relatable element to that. Um, we don't want to think that someone else is creating content or a robot's creating the content. We want to feel like that person is connecting with us directly. Um, this next tip, best performing content should be repurposed, recreated and talked about multiple times over. Can we just talk about best performing content for a second? You have analytics on just about every single social media platform you need to go and find those analytics. Instagram is really good for this. I know I'm bullish on Instagram, but I'm just obsessed with the way that it does analytics and makes it easy for you. Uh, but most platforms have analytics. Find out your best piece of content. What has the most reach? What has the most engagement? And then recreate that content in a completely different way. So an example of that, is I went through and looked at my Instagram content, the best, uh, the most far-reaching content over the last year. And the second most far-reaching piece of content for me was a little carousel and I drew it on my bullet journal and I said, you know, what most people think of when um, you tell them to do video and it's a pie chart that's split in half and it says YouTube on one side and Facebook Live on the other. And then on the follow, following um, posts, like in within the carousel, I said, what you actually are able to do with video. And I listed all the different possible ways to go live and then all the different possible ways to have pre-recorded video. And that was a really well-performing post for me. And so this week I actually made, or actually last week, I made an Instagram reel using that concept. I didn't do that exact concept again. I said I made an Instagram reel that said nine different ways to use video in your business. So you can see how I've taken something that I know already works, it's proven to work, and I've created something new out of it. And the idea is that hopefully that will work too um, because I'm just presenting pretty much the same idea um, just in a different way. So it's a really good idea to find your best performing content and do it over and over and over again because most of us really only have a couple of different messages that we're ever sending in our business. So we actually need to learn to communicate our message again and again and again in different ways. And then the final point there, ask yourself, when you're looking at your pillar content, ask yourself, can I represent this visually in a new way? Can I turn it into a pie chart? Can I turn it into a bar graph? Can I turn it into a quote? Can I turn it into a tweet? Can I turn it into an educational carousel? Um, you know, asking yourself those questions. Can I turn it into a list? Can I turn it into a checklist? Um, and can I explore any one part of this more deeply? Like I said to you before with that email example with the Instagram Reels video, I can actually go more deeply simply on why someone should use Instagram Reels right now because there's a lot of people out there who are not convinced. They don't want to learn something new. Um, they don't understand the value of jumping on something early, and I can really deep dive into that alone. Uh, you know, before I'm even talking about how to actually do it within the tutorial. So those points there really just a mindset for you 
to start thinking about um, ways to approach your content. And I've just got this little part on distribution because I know that um, distribution was part of today. But honestly, I, I really do find that distribution is not the issue for most people. It's, it's the content creation aspect because that's the time consuming bit. Distribution is essentially getting it out into the world. And once the content's there, it's a matter of just posting it. So um, if you are finding distribution difficult, though, I would recommend scheduling it out through Buffer, through Facebook Creator Studio, those kinds of things. And then my final slide for you is the tools that you can use. Um, a lot of you are probably familiar with, with these, um, but if you've got Canva and a smartphone, you've pretty much got everything you ever need. Um, and then I've added in there for you Headliner app. So that's the app I was talking about before that takes your audio and turns it into a video that you can then use. Um, I think you get the choice of just about any platform that you want to export it for. Um, so it exports it in the right dimensions. Now, on the free version, you can't brand it and it will be watermarked. However, you can put an image in the background, like just a still image, and it will create an audio file over the top. Brand the heck out of that. You don't need to pay for the upgrade to, to have your little logo on it. You brand the heck out of it. You put your picture on it. You put your logo on it. Um, you put the title on it, and you can go to town on that. Um, I've also listed creative market there because if you're struggling with micro content for Instagram or really any platform, if you're struggling for ideas, go to creative market, spend $30, <laughs> get a whole bunch of ideas, and then just use those as your template. And also Canva has a ton of templates anyway. So uh, it's a really great place to start for free. And then I've also just listed there um, different scheduling tools, Buffer, Hootsuite, um, but F Facebook Creator Studio is free and will uh, schedule to Instagram and Facebook for you. So they're really great places to start. Um, and then that's me. That's the two different places that I am on the most. Um, I've got tons of tutorials over on YouTube and then Instagram. If you want to connect with me directly, that is the best, best place to do it because I love Instagram. I'm on stories every day. I pretty much post every day. Um, and if you have any further questions or you want to connect, uh, it's, it's best to do it there. Um, and I'm going to put the screen back to Lenka because that is the end of the presentation. Awesome. Well, this was fantastic. Thank you so much. We okay. have quite a few interesting questions, so let's dive in. The first one is from Luke, and he's touching at the audio pillar, and he's asking, how do you get people to listen to your podcast? Is it as simple as publicizing it on your social media channels, or is there something more that you need to do to really get people tuning into your podcast? Yeah, so... Well, on that, if you're turning it into other content and putting it everywhere, you're going to get the more eyeballs on it initially, right? But further to that point, if you if you are creating a podcast and that's your pillar piece of content, one thing that I am very big on is send everybody there. When you meet anyone, when you have a call to action, when you create a an article or a blog post, post or anything around it, send everybody to that particular channel. Once you become one-eyed about a, a, um, a platform, it becomes easier to grow it because you're not thinking, should I send them to my email list? Should I send them to my Facebook group? Should I send them to my download? It, it just makes it easy to send it to that pillar piece of content. And then we all know we need to be building our e email list. So make sure that within that podcast, you have a downloadable a call to action to get on your email list, right? So that we're doing all the right things. Yeah. And I would say, as with everything social digital, it does take time to build yeah. a base. And I just seen a post from Joe Glover. You probably will know him in our community from the Marketing Meetup. And the Marketing Meetup has a podcast. And they now have hit about 120 episodes. 
And only now it's been a couple of years that has been doing monthly talks. It's getting exponential growth. And yes, they've been doing a great job in promoting it and stuff, but it does take a while to really get to the point of having exponential or having a loyal base of people who will later on tune in day in, day out, and they will tell all their friends. So there is, I think, a fairly big aspect of uh, word of mouth and loyalty, especially when it comes to podcasts and YouTube channels. Agreed. Yeah. There is an, another question from Luke. Um, he's asking, would you recommend adding text to a company, a photo or any social media channel for algorithm? So how would you represent a photo or a visual on social media? Yeah, it really depends. I truly believe on Instagram, for example, if you're putting a, a photo on there, I believe long gone are the days of just putting up a selfie or a photo with no context to it. Um, I think there's too much saturation now to be able to get away with that. So I like to put text on all visual elements. I really think that helps the person scrolling stop if your content matters to them. It is harder for them to know if it matters to them when it's just a photo. So I'm really big on providing context wherever you can. Yeah, it definitely says something about accessibility of making your content. If it's audio and you have captions and you have some text, it may, still makes the piece of content more accessible to people. And obviously it is definitely way more eye-catching and it captures people's attention. And the next question is from our community manager, Tana, and she's looking more at the client um, kind of social media manager perspective, asking how do you get your clients to create content in a way that would help you then to repurpose it? Well, so I have, have global clients. So for me, my local ones, I do the pillar content for them. So all of our clients do video because I make them <laughs> um, because I know how valuable it is. So with my global clients, I often do the research for them and I, I basically hand it to them on a platter and say, I need you to create this. Um, some of them do written like blog posts and that kind of thing. But again, I'm researching for them. I'm giving them the ideas. I'm trying to take the friction out of it. Um, so as much as you can, you know, if you're a social media manager, as much as you can give them framework, um, deadlines, uh, headlines, you are going to get a better result. And the other side to that is invoice up front. If somebody has already paid you for the month ahead, they're more likely to do the work needed. So don't invoice after the fact, or you're just going to keep putting it off, putting it off, putting it off, or they're going to go, can I pay you for half the month? Cause I only gave you half the amount of things that you need. And, um, it's just, it's just difficult. And I've done it both ways and I've learnt <laughs> I've learned from my mistakes. Yeah. That's very helpful. Yeah. We have a question from Alex and um, asking about hashtags. Is it better to have a broader hashtags or very specific hashtags? And as well, is it better if you put it to the copy or to the comments? Okay. So let me address the second part of this first because it's it's the simplest part. It doesn't matter. You can put it in the caption. You can put it in the comments. It really doesn't matter. It's still going to show up within the hashtags. Um, I Hashtags are a really interesting topic and they are their own training. I have spent, I spent the better part of a year last year experimenting with hashtags i have i have seen other people's theories on them i have tried those theories and i've never found anything that i am convinced works really really well i think hashtags particularly on instagram are getting to the point where 
um, even though there's new hashtags popping up all the time and there's small hashtags, for the most part, um, I'm not entirely convinced that people are searching that way. Um, so all that to say, experiment, which is not the answer you wanted. I know everyone wants black and white answers, but I would say experiment. I'm more about niched hashtags than big broad hashtags because really at the end of the day, you'll never rank for a big broad one that's got millions of posts in there already. Um, but I would focus more on the content that you're putting out. Mm -hmm. I would focus more on the time that you're posting, um, you know, using logic to, even if you don't use analytics, just use logic. Like when are people on? When are you always on? For, you know, unless you're a shift worker, for most people they're on after dinner, after the kids are in bed or early morning or on their lunch break. Um, so I've actually got a video coming out soon about the best times to post on social media. But I think that that's more helpful to look at those types of things than to rely on hashtags because I, I, I am just convinced that they are a dying strategy, put it that way. That's interesting. And, and I'm sorry, I know that that's not what you wanted to hear. Um, but, but on the other hand, I have another alternative to this. Uh, last week we had a specific training about Instagram hashtags where we had someone who spent an hour in our group doing training about how to really use hashtags, how to research them, how to plan them, how to use them effectively. So I will drop a link to the comments to the recording of the session. And if um, you want to have a look at it, Alex, if you want to watch it and check out what advice um, Helen gave us last week about Instagram hashtags, then we have a specific training exactly about this. But I absolutely agree with Sarah that there are things that do matter the most. Rather than hashtags, it is the quality of the content. It is the timing as well as using stories, reels, all the new feature. That's where Instagram will definitely give you more boost and it will like you. As well as being proactive with your engagement and really driving conversations, comments and stuff like that on your posts. We have a very interesting question from Krishna. And it's something that I had on my mind as well. She's asking how to best revamp an old blog post. It's been written on her website and how to repurpose it that maybe there is something new has changed in this year or how would you go around kind of bringing back to life some of the older pieces of content that we definitely have somewhere online? Yeah, so it really depends on you know, if you're doing it for SEO purposes or not. Like if you've got SEO kind of traffic um, coming to that, then I would just, yeah, update it and, and put 2020. Um, a really good, you know, if that's not the case, then something people do on YouTube all the time is, you know, five ways to grow Instagram in 2020, five ways to grow Instagram in 2021. And it's and the idea behind it is that you can write a whole new blog post if you want, if you feel things have really changed. Um, I think in the case of a blog post, because of just the way that it falls into um, kind of like that archive that happens on a website, it... Again, there's a, there's a lot of context missing, but um, you know, for you, if it if people are coming to your website more than they're coming to your social media channels, um, and you want it to be something that shows up, I would write it again or I'd repost it. Um, however, if you're just repurposing elements for social media, there's nothing stopping you going back into the archives and simply just you know putting it into some kind of spreadsheet and being like, okay, I've repurposed that blog now. And now I'll go on to the next one. Um, because if the content's still relevant and it's still valuable, then you should be able to go back in and and use it anywhere. I hope that answered the the question. Yeah, I think at least for me it was what I would be looking for uh, in terms of I know myself, I have lots of old content on my website. And sometimes when I get there, I'm like, what should I be doing with, all this content 
should I be repurposing it? Should I be rewriting? Should I be resharing it and stuff like that? One of my questions is how do you kind of then plan for your social media? How frequently will you repost and reshare a piece of content? So how much potentially is too much about one piece of content? Um, yeah, that's a really interesting question. I I think it really depends on the platform. Like Twitter, you could tweet every hour about the same thing and it wouldn't matter. Um, but I do think that you have to remember the difference between a promotional piece of content and a value-driven piece of content. Mm -hmm. And then as well as that, what are your business goals? What are you trying to get people to do? Are you selling services? Do you have a free call for them to be booked into? Do you have a course you want them to sign up to? So remembering that all of these factor into the decisions that you make and, um, you know, I can't just be putting thumbnails on my Instagram feed all the time. I have to be thinking about re-engaging people in new ways and so that's why I have video and that's why I have images and that's why I have carousels that are educational. So it's really about splitting up um, how you're approaching it so again, it's not the black and white answer that we probably all want, but I think it's it's a you know it's applying a little bit of common sense as well. Going, would I be bored hearing this again without it being an educational post or positioned differently? Because like I said in the you know in the with the slides up, we. We all really only have a couple of different messages and we're just trying to find different ways to say the same thing. So we are always going to feel like we're a broken record um, and it's up to us to create that relatable content and then the educational content um, and then you know, inspirational, motivational content or whatever you want to call it because we're trying to engage people at different levels and um, and through different avenues, not just always banging them with promotional stuff like go and watch my, my video, go and watch my video, go and watch my video um, or educating them every single day. Like that gets tiring. People get overwhelmed. So it's just about mixing it up. I think it's okay to share the same message, but it's mixing up how you do it so that when people receive it, they don't feel like they're necessarily getting the exact same message. Wow, perfect timing. We're one minute until the hour is finished. So I think um, we've answered all the questions that I could see in the comment section. So thank you everyone for being here today. Thank you for watching even if it's a little later. And a huge shout out and thank you so much, Sarah, for getting up super early for us and still delivering so much value under one hour. Thank you so much for having me. It was such a pleasure. And if you like, if anyone has any other questions, I'm more than happy for them to reach out to me and, um, and, and ask, like I'm very approachable and I'll get back to you. Yeah, absolutely. I'll make sure that I'll share links to your YouTube because I'm regularly watching your YouTube videos. They're super help helpful and always, you know, you can learn obviously from the content of what you're saying. But as you said, there's something about watching how you do things, be it on YouTube or be it on social media, where we can learn so much as well from just watching how you then share it, talk about it, repurpose it. So uh, thank you so much. We have some comments. Thank you. Great session. So fantastic. Thank you, everyone. And have a lovely evening. And you, Sarah, have a lovely day. Thank you. Bye. Bye.